Hello and welcome to this bonus episode on the Rewatch Project feed. Uh, I'm Mike and I am bringing you uh, this interview with Mark Singer, actor from V, the miniseries that we recently covered on the show, and also uh, from a whole plethora of other um, TV shows and films, including The Beastmaster, the classic uh, sci-fi fantasy film from 1982, uh, as well as lots of other TV, TV work, including Dallas and a whole load of other stuff. So uh, this is a very enjoyable conversation. And uh, yeah, just a quick reminder that uh, if you could like and subscribe, and if you could share, and uh, if you could send us feedback, because that's always appreciated at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com. So we will get started with that interview now. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, longtime listeners of my various shows will know that I'm a big fan of this particular actor from his various roles on the stage and screen, including the Beastmaster series, the V franchise, and many memorable roles on television and the silver screen. It's a real privilege to be joined by the talented artist and storyteller extraordinaire, I hear, uh, Mark Singer. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. We've been in communication for a couple of months at least, I think, before before we've been able to hook up. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, oh, and thank you for your flexibility. As, a, as I said in the email, being in New Zealand, it's fiendishly difficult to uh, to, to arrange these things, but uh, it's definitely worth the wait to have a, ha have a conversation with you about you and your career. And uh, I was just wondering, I thought a good place to start, I mean, uh, chronologically was, I was hoping you could just tell me a little bit about your family and your upbringing, because I understand that you grew up around the arts, particularly music? Yes. Yeah, my father uh, and mother, both. Uh, my father is a, was a symphony conductor. Uh, my mother was a virtuosic uh, classical pianist. Uh, my uncle was a pianist. My aunt was uh, a pianist. Uh, my brother is a, cello, a, vi a violinist. My sister, Lori, is a cellist. Um, and, uh, and in my childhood, uh, although we moved from city to city in every city we were in, the greatest classical musicians of the day were a regular feature in my household. I guess that's how I came to be a, a kind of uh, a, a classical actor in my, in my original intention, although uh, everybody likes a good adventure. They certainly do. And I was wondering if, I mean, you mentioned the sort of the classical side of things. If okay. we could just talk a little bit about... Um, your stage work, particularly Shakespeare. Um, I mean, I, I watched your very fun and very physical uh, Taming of the Shrew that you did for the American Conservatory Theatre. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you could just maybe tell our audience, perhaps maybe the, particularly the younger listeners, although, although I don't want to make any assumptions, about what you feel the sort of power and value of Shakespeare is, particularly to a modern audience. Sure, of course. Well, you know, it's uh, it's there's so many. I mean, you're speaking to a monomaniac on the subject, so you know, get ready. I'll come at it from every angle at the same time. Try to keep it organized. Shakespeare's like that. Uh, Shakespeare covers all his work uh, from from every angle at the same time. Just before I start, bear with me. I'm not. I'm, I won't leave you. This volume, which I just had rebound. This is the family Bible, oh, and it beautiful. says Shakespeare. That's what's on the that's what's on the cover. That's what I was raised with. Shakespeare. This is my father's old uh, Shakespeare anthology, and uh, and this is what I learned my first speech from uh, back in the uh, uh, in grade five, and um, uh, for any young actor and any. Uh, already accomplished uh, professional, uh, I would say, read Shakespeare, read Shakespeare, read Shakespeare, and most importantly, read Shakespeare like he's never been read before, because that's where you're going to find out what Shakespeare's really about, not all the stuff that's put out everywhere. You know, I appreciate that you, that you mentioned uh, The Taming of the Shrew that I was in. Uh, the reason that was so important to me and remains so important to me is because my intention when I was uh, uh, awarded that that role uh, was to put my stamp on that play for all times. And uh, we live in an age now where uh, film and video uh, allow us to do that. Um, Laurence Olivier's Richard III, his Henry V, and uh, I would argue also his Hamlet, 
he's put his stamp on to such a degree that nobody can play that play, any one of those plays, without thinking of him. Um, your, your performance in that particular version, I think, is characterized by a number of things. I mean, the things that jumped out at me, and that was, uh, I'm I'm a English literature geek. I, I grew up in the UK, just down the road from Stratford, so it was part of my life. And wow. um, I think that the things that really show through that, that particularly that, that American Conservatory Theatre, which is available, I should point out, that was a film performance, hence my, uh, my ability to be able to talk about it, is, first of all, just how hilarious it is, how in tune and synchronised the performances are, um, but also the incredible physicality. The thing I took away from your performance from that is it must have been exhausting. Uh, well, it was, um, but you know, uh, if it's not exhausting and if it's not uh, uh, on uh, borderline dangerous, it's not worth doing. I'm paraphrasing Laurence Olivier when I say that. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, that's the point, is that Shakespeare demands everything of you, uh, male and female. It, uh, it takes giants and uh, none of us are, but we can strive toward that, uh, toward that stature. The important thing about Shakespeare is that the more you study him and the more you uh, study him from the acting standpoint, not from the scholar standpoint. From the scholarship standpoint, I have no argument. Nobody can all argue with scholarship nor the value of scholarship. We're all grateful to scholarship. But until you play professional cricket, until you play professional soccer or baseball or football, until you are a professional Shakespearean actor, you can never really understand Shakespeare uh, to his fullest degree. And um, uh, it's in the enacting that Shakespeare, Shakespeare's real intelligence and his real um, uh, um, uh, uh, enhancement of your own IQ and of the audience's IQ strikes. Um, because that's what he's about. He's about critical thinking and connective reasoning. And Have you so, ever had an opportunity? Sorry, to jump in. This is fascinating. Oh, you can um, jump in any time. Otherwise, I'll, 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 thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Is, yeah, have yeah. you ever had an opportunity to reinterpret a role, to perform the same role at two different points in your career? Is that something you'd be interested in, or is that something you've had an opportunity to do to actually put a different um, coat of paint on the same role? I'm, I'm, uh, uh, you know, the 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 opportunity to do roles in Shakespeare. Uh, regardless of your stature, are few and far between. And they are for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is uh, simply because, uh, just simply because they are. Where are you going to find Troilus and Cressida being mounted if that's your prefer if that's your preferred play? And that's my preferred play. Troilus and Cressida is, in my opinion, Shakespeare's greatest play, better than Hamlet. Very underrated. Oh, yeah. Well, extraordinarily underrated. And it's underrated because it is, I think, the most uh, demanding and gigantic uh, of his works. Um, uh, but where are you going to find that uh, being mounted? That's number one. Number two, where are you going to find if you're as, uh, 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 as uh, exacting? Uh, you can, I, I know I'll be tagged with, uh, with uh, snotty or snobbish or, uh, or hubris with this, but where are you going to find actors and actresses that are willing to devote their last drop of blood and intelligence and uh, 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 to, the, to the utmost understanding of it. I'm currently working, I get up every morning at four o'clock uh, in the morning and I uh, devote myself to an essay on Lady Macbeth, how to play Lady Macbeth, because I think she is of all his greatest characters and certainly of, of his greatest female characters. Uh, she is his uh, most sadly uh, misinterpreted, and it does a great it does a great disservice to her and to to all of Shakespeare's works. But she is continually uh, played as a harridan, which is a great disservice to Shakespeare's uh, fineness of understanding. And to and it doesn't it and 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 so if young actors would read <laughs> Shakespeare and uh, and uh, and consider him uh, very deeply and not as he's usually played, uh, they will grow as actors. You mentioned these sort of formative experiences that you had in what sounds like a very sort of creatively very fertile ground in, in your household. Was this something that you were encouraged towards? Was there an expectation that you would engage with the arts or was there, what was the sort of feeling from, from your family as far as expectations around yourself and your sister? 
I was raised in Texas the ex, uh, uh, in my early childhood, my formative years, and my, the expectation and the hope and the prayer of my family was that I would learn to read and write. Um, the, um, uh, I was as, uh, as, uh, as hard-headed a numbskull as you'd ever find uh, uh, splashing around in the Gulf of Mexico where I was raised in Corpus Christi. And, um, you know, I, I led a Huckleberry Finn existence, and so there was no, there was no real incentive for me to uh, uh, to, to, to think of, of anything uh, uh, academic and certainly not in that setting. Um, my father, however, insisted and even tricked me into going to the theater to see Laurence Olivier's Richard III on film. He told me it was about knights uh, and I went to see it. And of course, the first half of the movie, I understood nothing. And I squirmed around in my seat and, you know, itched and wanted to go home. In the second half, I understood everything and it was fantastic. And I went home, immediately began working on Shakespeare. Uh, he himself was the conductor in the pits for uh, a famous Broadway production of Laurence Olivier's, which was Antony and Cleopatra and Caesar and Cleopatra back to back, night after night after night wow. after night. On did, you say, did you get to experience that? I was, but I was a babe in arms. And, and even so, I still remember just uh, like the squint of a dream uh, off in the corner of my consciousness. I remember uh, my mother holding me in her arms as standing at the back of the house uh, when it was being uh, played. But, but Olivier was my, was my model. I, I was I was curious, and this, that's a useful segue to the next question, really, about those those formative experiences and familial uh, expectations. Because, of course, your sister Laurie uh, also had, you know, her her career. Uh, you 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 got a little bit of a head start there with the roles that you were sort of you know doing in the seventies, like um, Planet of the Apes, Hawaii Five O. I think you, you did some Jigsaw yeah. John, Bar Barnaby Jones, those sort of things before before um, before Beastmaster. But of course, I'd say that sort of it's interesting that both yourself and your sister were involved experiencing cultural phenomena um, adjacent to each other. Her, of course, with fame, um, and you yourself with uh, with that double whammy of Beastmaster and, and V. And I'm just wondering, was how was that? Was, what was your sort of relationship like at the time in regards to your careers? Was it, was the, was it competitive? Was it supportive? Oh, we were, we were uh, completely supportive. Uh, and have always remained so. The, the, uh, the thing that was, I think, important to us then and probably remains important to us now is that e each of us is a separate entity. We each have our own take. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that uh, actors uh, and performers of all sorts, musicians and uh, you, know, you, you name it, uh, part, of, part, of, part of our secret is, is the mystery that we come to recognize in and of ourselves. And it's a kind of, um, uh, it, 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 it gains in, in, uh, in power as we, as we progress and as we develop. And so it's a kind of a sacred ground uh, uh, between uh, actors and directors and writers and producers and so forth that, uh, uh, that, that those areas remain uh, sacred and separate. And so I've always respected her, her space, and she's always respected mine. And, and uh, other than that, we, we speak as, uh, as brother and sister and, uh, and as artists. We just, uh, we, talk about, uh, we talk about performances, we talk about where we are in our development uh, and things like that. But as far as the secret inner workings of it, um, uh, she's, I think, more protective of hers than I am of mine. Uh, because she is more, I would, I know I'm just, I'm, I'm spinning this off the top of my head. She is more the modern actress, uh, uh, working from what people assume is the inside, in quotes. And, uh, and for me, I'm a Stanislavskian. I'm, uh, I'm about architecture and uh, uh, um, uh, structure and, and things like that. So we approach it maybe a little differently, but, uh, but you know, Every actor comes to it in the end uh, with the same with the same admixture of uh, of technique and uh, and what's known as sincerity. I made mention a moment ago about those, I guess, those sort of like formative 
experiences that you had, um, primarily in television, in episodic um, television. Now, I'm just wondering how that, how did that lead to Beastmaster? How, how did you get Beastmaster? Because that must have felt like an incredible opportunity, this large motion picture. You know, I, uh, I, I just want to tell you, you know, you talk about, uh, you talked earlier, you, you asked if there was something that I could say to young actors and young actresses. And one of the things is, yes, you know, follow your dream. If you really want to be an actor or an actress, study hard, uh, practice your craft. It's a craft, not an art. It's not a religion. It's not a mystery. It's a craft. And it can be learned just like uh, building a desk or, or putting together a motorcycle or something. It's a craft. And I, as uh, germane to your to your to your point, and and uh, and also uh, informative, I think in its own way as to how how possible it is to become whatever it is you want to become in life. When I came driving up the freeway with my wife toward uh, Los Angeles, we were both working at the time in the National Shakespeare Festival in San Diego. Uh, uh, we were having a wonderful time, young actor and actress, uh, and traveling itinerantly from uh, regional theater to regional theater. We're driving up the freeway toward Los Angeles and the sign overhead said, Hollywood, next three exits. And I'm, now I'm a young man already. I've got a, a, a significant other who is going to be my wife in another year or two. I turned to her, we're already making a living. I'm, I'm uh, enjoying a, a modicum of success. I turned to her and, I, and the sign says, Hollywood, next three exits over the freeway. I turned to her and I said, there's an actual Hollywood. I said, I didn't know there was a real Hollywood. I thought it was like an idea or something. Like Neverland. A Neverland, exactly. Like Neverland, like we're going to Neverland. We're going to Hollywood. And we got off the freeway there. Uh, and that's how far back I started uh, in, in terms of developing a, a film career that would eventually lead me to things like the television series V or, or the Beastmaster, or if you could see what I hear, or any of the other films or television episodes that, I, that I've done. Was it for your agent? No, in, in, both, uh, in both instances of the Beastmaster and also the television series V, in both instances, uh, my agent was uh, simply contacted uh, by the director producer of either show, um, Don Coscarelli, in fact, uh, had seen my performance as Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew. And when he saw that, he said, that's my Beastmaster. That's the guy. That's who I want. And, uh, and so really, our meeting was more of a confirmation uh, as far as he was concerned. And, and, uh, and for me, it came about because I said to my agent at the time, the next leading role that comes across my desk, I'm playing it. I don't care what it is. Mm. And it turned out to be the Beastmaster. And, and he was not, uh, as agents sometimes are, um, he was not as convinced uh, as I was. But that was the time when sword and sorcery and a, a dystopian future and a kind of uh, a sci-fi slant on sort of double universes was coming into into common consciousness and into entertainment and so i really understood uh the genre i understood what beastmaster was uh and uh, and i was able i i really was convinced that there was nobody to play that role except me and by the way coincidentally and this is that kind of synchronicity in life that is uh, uh that's so striking sometimes carl jung wrote a whole book about it called synchronicity um uh, and that is that at the time I was studying, and still am, Hunga uh, 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 Fu Hok, which is uh, Kung Fu based on the tiger and the crane. And so here I am suddenly down the road now, uh, co-starring with a tiger. Wow. And I, Synchronicity I felt, I felt, in action. Yes, absolutely. I, and I, I felt a great deal of, of camaraderie and, compa and uh, companionship and, and ease with the tiger uh, that the handlers kept saying, don't do that, don't do that, this guy will eat you. And I kept saying to them, you don't, you know, no, no, you don't get it, We're, we've got a thing going. And they, of course, would roll their eyes and go actors, you know, you can't talk to them. So. And when you secured that role, um, what was your feeling? Was there a feeling of, okay, this is another role? This is, uh, or was there a feeling of, okay, here we go, I'm on the roller coaster now, this could, this could, this could lead to something. What were your sort of initial reactions when you secured that role? 
it was it was getting on to winter when uh, uh, when I was uh, cast in the Beastmaster, and we were in those days uh, the world was in a different uh, climatic situation, and uh, there was a lot of rain, um, and I would strip down to my skivvies in the late evenings when the rain was pouring down, and uh, stand well stand hell. I would climb the trees in my backyard. And uh, and uh, and yeah, <laughs> leap from branch to branch in the moonlight like a rhesus monkey on bed. And but please tell me that your neighbors saw you doing this. Oh, I, I'm quite convinced that they were. We we were new. We were new to the neighborhood, and I'm quite convinced that they were uh, that they themselves were convinced that uh, that danger had arrived. Um, hmm. So anyway, but when you ask me what it was like. Uh, I knew that I would be swinging swords against guys that I had never met before. And I knew that I would be uh, taxed uh, physically by the cold and, uh, and also uh, in the presence of, uh, of, of wild animals. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and at the same time, I also knew, I also felt on the positive side uh, as opposed to the um, uh, defensive angle that I just spoke of. On the positive side, that this was something that was uh, a, like a lifetime dream coming true, and so it was easy for me to give myself to it that way. Rewatching both V and Beastmaster recently, I think one thing that comes across in your performances is you can see that you're a hard worker. Um, I mean, whether that be just physical, throwing yourself into the performance, or the actual physicality of the role, do you? Is that a natural work ethic? Is that something that you picked up from your family? Is that something that you've always had? You know, I was very fortunate. Uh, uh, I was I was always very physical. That's that's just that just is my natural tendency. And again, being raised in Texas on the Gulf of Mexico, um, uh, being physical was that was just the way of things. Um, but when I when I began to study the martial arts and Kung Fu, um, uh, I began to, uh, uh, I began to realize and, and achieve things as an actor uh, that had I not developed uh, the strength that, uh, that Kung Fu uh, particularly built into me, I would not have been able to accomplish. Um, uh, when it came to something like the Beastmaster, I was very fortunate. I've been very fortunate all my life in the people who've helped me and advised me. Now, and this is no genius springing out of me like, uh, like you know, Hera from the, from the mind of, uh, who was it, Creon or Zeus's father. You know, this, was, this, is, this is all the product of people who are generous with their knowledge and, and who knew more than, than I and passed it along. There's a great director or stuntman now passed away because of COVID, I hear, uh, named uh, Chuck Bale. And Chuck Bale gave me my real education in film history and in the responsibility of, uh, of playing leads and what that meant. Uh, and uh, so in, the, in every role since then, uh, I've taken my responsibility much more seriously uh, in, ter in terms of my responsibility for, uh, toward the company and toward my own department, the acting department, toward the script. But what he, pointed, what he made me aware of, which really appealed to me and to, to my physical tendencies, is that when you watch an old John Wayne movie, those weren't stunts those guys were performing. That's what they brought to work with them every day. They got on those horses and they rode at breakneck speeds up and down hills and, uh, and through the canyons. And if those horses went down on top of them, they'd die or they'd be injured. And there was no, there was no fooling around about it. Uh, and they were people who thought of stunts as, as the only thing they couldn't do or weren't allowed to do. Uh, and that's the way uh, I was schooled in a sense. And so whenever I do my own work, uh, uh, even, uh, even as I age, uh, I still, I want to do as much as I can do because uh, to me, that's just what you bring to work. That's in your kit bag. You mentioned John Wayne. Uh, and I think that 
re-watching um, Beastmaster recently. And the thing that, that really jumped out at me this time is how much it does. It feels like a Western. Uh, and I was just wondering if that was something that you were mindful of. And also, do you have an affinity with the genre? Because, I mean, I would imagine that as your career was starting to rise in the 70s, the genre was already starting to wane somewhat. No, no pun intended. Um, and I was just wondering if that... Did you feel like maybe if you'd born, been born a little bit earlier, that this was a genre that you would have inhabited? It, it, it definitely was a genre that I would have inhabited had I, had I lived a, a decade or so uh, earlier. Um, as it was, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, grab the tail end of it. Um, there's a revival of Westerns now, which I'm glad to see. Mm. I myself write Western West, uh, cowboy poetry. Uh, so uh, uh, it's something that, that uh, and I've worked on a ranch too, uh, Chuck's Ranch, as a matter of fact. And um, um, so it's something that's, uh, that's deep in my, in my ethos. Um, but um, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of cowboy in, uh, in the Beastmaster. Um, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Your perception is absolutely correct there. And, and um, uh, the, there was a transition historically in the industry at that time. A younger, an entire younger generation of stunt people were now superseding the older stuntmen, the original stuntmen's association. Uh, and um, uh, um, this, uh, this new group was coming in younger. And the old group, which had cut its teeth, oh hell, they'd invented the Westerns. Uh, these were old cowboys and, uh, and rousters, uh, tough as nails, every one of them from the old school. Nobody warmed up in the morning. You just took a fall off a horse or you crashed through a roof or you fell off a tree and uh, got up and shook yourself and said, okay, let's go do something else now. Whilst smoking cigarettes the entire time. Oh. Oh, absolutely! Smoking, smoking cigarettes, and uh, and uh, and uh, and taking whatever medication they needed to take to fix the broken shoulder from last night. Um, uh, some of the things that were uh, on the set of uh, Beastmaster were just absolutely jaw dropping and stunning. Um, uh, the first day that I saw Chuck Bale at work, he organized all these "quote unquote" old timers uh, on horseback to raid the village, uh, which was huts upon gigantic telephone pole height uh, um, uh, stilts. And, they, and, the, and these things would catch fire and collapse uh, while the horses were charging through and people were being trampled, you know, visually they were being trampled, actually not. Uh, and, uh, and it was amazing to watch these old timers run these hair raising stunts like clockwork, like a football team, just play after play after play after play, and with such precision and such ease, and uh, and and it took such physical stamina on the one hand, and such amazing balletic skill on the other from these gigantic, monstrously muscled, tough, weasened, scarred up veterans. Uh, and when it was all, when the day was done, you really felt that you had seen. Uh, what, what the, the most professional of professionals uh, could bring off in the film industry. And that, things like that are, are, the, are the kind of things that inform you as your career goes on. And, what uh, a gift for you yeah. to be able to see that, to be able to see. And I guess you mentioned the sort of the, the almost the ballet, the sort of balletic element of it. And I guess, again, that's another connection to some of the perhaps modern perceptions around um masculinity and things like Shakespeare of course as well you know we've all yeah. heard the old ballet dancers are you know sissies but also we we know that most ballet dancers could could kick your ass if it came <laughs> down to it and I'd imagine and Shakespeare's similar I mean like I say seeing some of your performances and other performances as well the physicality of those roles that's um there's some tough guys in that world oh there's some very tough guys in that world I I um uh, you know, I, 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 I give you this for nothing. People, uh, there's a specific role in Shakespeare. I did, I did an, uh, an evening, a one, a one man show, uh, and I called and, uh, it was, and I called it our Shakespeare because it was an hour long. So it was our Shakespeare. And so it was, at, it was exactly 60 minutes long. I played 15 different characters. 
uh, all by all by memory and uh, and to the fullest extent that one man can convey the the sense of an entire play in a in a single uh, offering. Sometimes two or three soliloquies put together. And uh, one of the characters that I played, who's always been dear to my heart, uh, was uh, Mercutio in um, in Romeo and Juliet. And people play Mercutio as so, sort of a, a goofy, daffy, romantic kind of playboy, bon vivant. Even uh, God bless his soul for the great actor that he that he was and untouchable. Uh, even John Barrymore in the in the filmic production, or oh, played him as a kind of a uh, I don't know a, I don't know a kind of a a, play, a playboy. That's the that's the best way I can put it. But if you study the role really carefully, you find out that this guy is suffering from PTSD, that he's a soldier, and that he's come back from wherever he's come back, and he's watched his friends drown, and he's watched and he's been scared to death as the Spaniards have come over the top, and that he's killed people and seen his friends die, that that's the way, he, that's why he is as he is. And so when you begin to understand Shakespeare and read Shakespeare in a new way and look deeply into what it is that Shakespeare is bringing forward, he's anything but a sissy. And his insights are as modern as modern medicine. Uh, and, and, uh, and so uh, 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 I just, I give that out there to any young actor who's going to try Mercutio or any company that's going to say uh, Mercutio uh, and, and as a kind of a wedge, you know, you find that little chink in the armor of, of Shakespeare and begin to pry it apart and see what's inside there. And you'll be astonished at what's, uh, what's available to you, male and female. I guess that's perhaps one of the challenges about maintaining uh, the tradition in the modern time is the amount of time it requires to really investigate and peel the onion for all of these things. And I'm just wondering, you've just made me think while you were speaking there, Mark, about how, whether there's any similarities or differences between perhaps an, en an engagement, an, a, an ongoing theatrical engagement where perhaps you play a role over a period of time and a television series, whether it's Mike Donovan or uh, Matt Cantrell or one of these characters that you, that you play for a period, are they completely different things because you've got a different script every week on TV, whereas on a prolonged engagement for the theatre, you're reinvestigating the same text. What's, what are the relationships between those two prolonged engagement types? Well, the, 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 the first and most uh, general on the one hand, but specific on the other, paradoxically, uh, is um, you got to know what you're doing uh, if you're going to play Shakespeare. You got to know what you're doing if you're going to play Shakespeare. You can't, you can't horse around. But on film, as long as you're appealing, as long as you're interesting, as long as you're mysterious, you can know almost nothing but be extraordinarily appealing and powerful in the position that you take about that. And you can be useful. You can still be useful. Why is that? Is that because of editing, being able to take multiple takes, proximity of the camp, the audience to the face of the person? Is if I, if I wanted a guy to play a heavy on film, I'd get a guy who was pretty close to being a professional heavy in life. You see what I mean? Because that's authenticity. And then what I would do is, depending on the degree of his abilities, I would limit or expand his camera time or his role accordingly. Whereas in Shakespeare, in classical theater, in something like uh, in Chekhov or something, also misunderstood Chekhov, in Chekhov or Shakespeare, something like that, you have to know your beans. You have to know what acting is. You have to be, you have to be at least educated uh, to that degree. Um, uh, it, the, I, I don't mean to denigrate uh, filmic acting because uh, I've had to work extremely hard uh, to become proficient as a film actor. Um, and my, my conclusion uh, these days is that, uh, uh, that 
each informs the other. I became a much better stage actor by learning how to act better on film. And certainly my filmic work uh, all depends on what I know from the stage. Uh, and, and so the two of them come together as in a very nice synthesis. Uh, I think one without the other uh, uh, is very limiting. And when, um, when Beastmaster was released, how, how did that affect your life? What, what, just on a practical level, I mean, what, what, was, what were the differences to your day-to-day -day life after the release of Beastmaster, or did it just feel the same? You know, I, I had, uh, I, my, my friend, uh, one of my friends referred, refers to it as a virgin run. Uh, and uh, I had come into, I had come into the acting uh, industry uh, on stage in a, out of a conservatory of 10 actors uh, in the University of Washington under an extraordinary Shakespearean teacher named uh, William Duncan Ross. Um, uh, and um, th there were 10 of us who had auditioned across the, from across the nation that were accepted. And, and uh, we were three years uh, day and night as a company, as a troupe. Uh, uh, and we played uh, during the summer months when we weren't acting on stage, playing the leads in, uh, in the university productions. We were then the uh, backbone of the regional theaters. And so I was already ready a professional before I was out of university uh, and then playing mainly and only uh, leads and supporting leads so that by the time I came into Los Angeles, uh, I just kept that trajectory going and playing the Beastmaster, uh, although it was wonderful and exciting and exhausting and exhilarating and, and uh, enlightening, all of those things, it just seemed like this was the natural course of things. It's only now looking back that I get some perspective on it and say, that's pretty extraordinary. Did it lead directly to V? Did you go to read for, what, for Kenny Johnson? What was what was the, the process there? Kenny Johnson, by the way. Oh, and and the, the other thing also, uh, please, please bear in mind, or I should, rather, I should remind people that, that coming into town on an upward tra trajectory uh, I then was accepted into a higher echelon of professional colleagues, uh, the Society of Professional Colleagues. And so uh, I was there learning from them and accepted as their equal. And so nothing that any of us were doing at that time seemed to be extraordinary because we were all, all doing things like that. Uh, and so that sort of ends up that little portion right there. As far as Kenny Johnson is concerned, same thing. Saw me in Taming of the Shrew, uh, also uh, uh, noted the heat that I had gotten uh, from the Beastmaster, uh, invited me into audition, uh, and took me in to meet Brandon Tartikoff, who was the head of uh, NBC programming at that time. I can't remember the, the title specifically. But usually when you do this, you know, you go into a big room, wedding nurse and there are other candidates waiting in the outside you know for their turn and you go into this big room with a, a bunch of executives sitting around and you go into your act they somebody reads opposite you and you say oh darling darling I've always loved you and and then you they say thank you very much and they get the next candidate in and of those minimal few that have made it to that point they then select who they want well, that wasn't the way with V. Kenny Johnson took me in the dead of night, as, uh, as I recall, into a back door through NBC, up through a hallway, into a little kind of closet space that was crammed with metal filing cabinets. And uh, it, it was almost like a janitor's closet, but it was some little tiny office. And there was Brandon Tartikoff, and here was Kenny Johnson. And Kenny Johnson said, here, look, this is Mark Singer. Here, 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 watch this, watch Brandon, watch. And he, he handed it, he handed me, he took the script and he said, do you know your lines? I said, yeah, I know my lines. He said, okay, okay, watch Brandon, watch. And he said, oh, Mike Donovan, he said to me playing the other role. He said, oh, Mike Donovan, he said, so, you know, we meet at last. Uh, it's uh, what do you think you'll, what do you think you'll, you know, what do you think of what's going on? And then I would open mouth to speak. And Kenny Johnson would say, and then he says, he says, oh yes, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go over here and I'll do this. And then later I'll do that. <laughs> And then he would say, he would say, 
Oh, yes. Well, let me tell you something, Mike Donovan. And he would switch over to the other role and he would say, he would say, if you think you can get away with it that easy, you've got another thing coming. And then I would go and he would go and he says, oh, yeah, you think so? Well, maybe not. I'll show you. And then <laughs> when he gets through doing this and I'm standing there <laughs> staring at him. And when he gets through doing this, he takes me by the shoulder and shoves me out the door. And I hear him as the door is closing, saying to Brandon Tartikoff, isn't he terrific? <laughs> and closes the door. I think Kenny had already made his choice by this point, hadn't he? I, I think so. And he and I have remained uh, dear friends today. I, we have breakfast together on occasion, and uh, he's an amazing guy. He's an amazing man. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to have a few conversations with Kenny. Um, and he's, like yourself, very generous and, yeah. uh, you know, it, it had a great career. And he, he was riding high. And I think one of the things about V that's interesting is. I mean, of the, just the things that people talk about, of course, you know, it's it's allegorical power, you know, it's timeliness, it's transferability to different eras of history. But one of the things that fascinates me about V is its place in the long forgotten form of the miniseries, of, which, of course, was a huge thing in the 70s and 80s. I mean, you did you did the Roots sequel quite early on, and I think you, I believe you did one of the Harold Robbins adaptations that yeah, were yeah, around as well. 79 Park Avenue. Yeah, and, and was that, um, I was just wondering if you could speak to that form, because that was a very popular form of storytelling, but, but all but all but disappeared, really. It was, uh, I tell you, the, the, those were the most fun things uh, to participate in. Uh, they were, um, they were as, as richly uh, uh, produced as a feature film might be, but they were expanded. Uh, and there was a kind of a fluidity in the way they were they were shot. They you you moved from scene to scene and from moment to moment within the scene uh, so fluidly. You moved at the pace of television, but the but the production values and the directors and the writing uh, was of of, uh, of filmic quality. The, the lavishness of the casting as well. I mean, this was also around the year, I guess, of the of the disaster movie as well, which That's were right. also very lavishly cast. Yeah. Yep. We, uh, uh, this is, this is, you know, one of the things about uh, acting uh, in a television format uh, is that you're, there's such a mix of personalities that come through that a very strong sense of community develops very quickly. And uh, uh, you find yourself working with Geraldine Page and you find yourself working, you know, with, uh, with, uh, uh, Henry Fonda and uh, Burt Lancaster and uh, 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 Maureen O'Sullivan, uh, 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 Maureen O'Hara, uh, Maureen O'Sullivan, Maureen O'Sullivan, and uh, uh, I mean I could go on and on. The list is uh, Jack Warden. I mean it's 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 extraordinary, and and all of these people, uh, and through them, uh, you begin to feel that you have not only a minor place, but a minor responsibility in the history of, of, uh, of, uh, of cinema, you know? It's, a, it's an extraordinary experience, it really is. And I think one of the things that often gets discussed in regards to V was the, um, particularly at the time, how powerful the, the, the cultural impact of it was with the, the collective, what we now call the water cooler experience of the show and as a if you just indulge me there's a little, little story i love to tell about v when it came out that i've, I've told to Ken, kenny as well is um as you, you may or may not know um it got a delayed release in the uk it didn't actually show until 1984 uh by which time you'd made the final battle as well so right. in the uk and in europe most of europe it was broadcast actually as a five-part miniseries with all five parts of the show um, and it was bought, it was, it was done that way to be counter-programming for the Los Angeles Olympics. Right. And I, I was on holiday with my family. Ten-year-old me was on holiday with my family. And this is back before hotel rooms had televisions in them. You'd have that one communal projector television. And uh, I remember distinctly that war broke out in the hotel between the um, LA um, Olympics contingent and the V contingent. But V swept through the hotel like this cultural plague. <laughs> and every morning for the whole five days we were on holiday, right. everybody was sat around at breakfast in the hotel 
talking about V. It was like it was like who shot JR? You know, that was the feeling, the ubiquity of it. Did you get that sense um in 83 when it uh, when it aired in America? You know, my 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 own feeling uh was and and it's always been this way as a matter of fact um uh is that i'm i'm really more in the vein of uh, laurel and hardy uh i remember the story that uh when they got off the boat in london uh, in england rather uh southampton probably and uh, they they got off the boat in southampton there was huge crowds waiting for them and they were as stunned as they could be they were, what are all these people doing here and of course they had come to see their favorites they'd come to see them and so when I'm when I'm at work and when I'm doing whatever I do, um, uh, my my focus is on the moment and my focus is on the work and and uh, and uh, uh, the rest of it uh, that attaches to it uh, uh, comes under under two headings. One of them is official and the other isn't. Uh, and so that's just the that's just okay. Yeah. You know, I just I love I love talking to people. I forget that people might be looking at me as in in some sort of uh, uh, a, as a double image, as a kind of a celebrity or somebody that they've seen on television that they have strong uh, feelings of uh, identity with. Um, and and to me, I'm just meanwhile marveling at how wonderful everybody in the world is. You know, when you when you're raised in a family of uh, classical musicians uh, back in the day. Where, where when I was, the the image was that they were long hair, wild eyed bohemians of fiery temperament and uh, and uh, and uh, explosive emotionality, you know. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that's true. That's, true. <laughs> that's what it was in my house, and uh, I wouldn't trade an instant of it. And uh, adored my upbringing, but I will say that in my day, back in black and white television time, um, there was a program on the air called Father Knows Best. And it was a Pollyanna middle-class household uh, uh, situation comedy in which nobody raised their voices. Nobody ever was red in the face. Nobody ever, you know, there was no storm on the horizon ever. And I have to say, it influenced my own sense of civics, and uh, and and set a um, a marker in my mind as to how I would prefer to live as I got older. Uh, and uh, granted, I I have many of the traits of my of my own family and my own upbringing, and then my own weaknesses as well. Uh, but I think the the influence uh, that we have cannot be denied. And therefore, uh, must be must be uh, monitored, and we have to hold ourselves responsible for that as well. Listeners yeah. of our show would probably um, be very annoyed with me if I didn't ask you about that famous scene in V, the uh, the reveal, the lizard reveal, and the fight sequence that uh, that, that followed. I'm sure you've been asked about this many times, and I, I'm going to allow myself this one indulgence, if I may. But could you tell uh, me I'll about the forward. filming of that scene? Yeah, sure. Uh, that scene, uh, you're talking about the one where I take the lizard and pull his cheek. Oh, yes. The... Yes, that, 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 what, uh, what, what these days we refer to as nightmare fuel, that sequence. <laughs> well, uh, that was the very last scene in the entire uh, miniseries that we filmed. And the reason that it was the last scene in the mini miniseries that we filmed was because I wanted to perform a stunt in it that they thought might cripple me. And so they said, well, then we're going to save that for the last, because if you die, then we, at least we have all the footage. How wonderfully self-serving of them to uh, <laughs> make that choice. It's a, it's a very, it's a warm hearted profession, deep, deep inside the part where you'll never see. So anyway, um, uh, the, the gag was that after I tore his mask off, tore his face off, that he picked me up in a, in a demonstration of how much more powerful physically they are than we. He picked me up, turned me sideways, and threw me across them so that I landed horizontally up against the bulkhead and then fell, boom, down to the inset bed below. It sounds okay. Um, 
uh, but because I actually was standing at the moment on top of a counter or a platform that I had jumped up on and he had knocked me back on or something like this. So I was already higher than he was. And so he grabbed me. And then all I had to do was to jump, was to leap across the room, turn myself sideways and go against that bulkhead and fall down. The only issue is that the bed, that the bulkhead ended here and the bed only came out this far. Oh dear. So there was no way for me to actually land on the bed. I was going to land on the spine of the, of the, of the bedside. And that's exactly what happened. I not only landed on the spine of the bedside, I landed on my spine on the spine of the bed spine. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, it, was, uh, it was a hell of a wreck, but it sure was effective. And, and it's it, all there on screen. It's all there on the screen. You're in that and, shot. There's, there's no fast edits away. From, it's, you can see that that's Mark Singer getting thrown against a wall. I learned so much about, about stunt work and about doing my own stunts. And the person that inspired me most in all of the, crea in all of the creativity aspects, all the creative aspects of, of my own stunt work, I, I take nothing away from David Ellis, who was a fantastic uh, stunt coordinator nor from any other stuntmen uh, in the uh, Buddy Joe Hooker or anybody else that was in the uh, 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 stunt teams that, that came aboard. But my inspiration for thinking up things that we could do that I felt I could do uh, was Buster Keaton, was that uh, I, if he was doing what he was doing, then I wanted a piece of that too, because he was the master at being unable to go from point A to point B without six or seven different things interfering uh, and, and giving him the opportunity to be physically creative. Whilst bringing tremendous humanity to his role as well, whilst doing so. Exactly, exactly. And that was the other aspect of it was that I didn't want people to, I didn't want to uh, be that kind of actor uh, that suddenly could leap tall buildings at a single bound and have the audience say, well, where did he, how did he do that? I mean, that's Mike Donovan. Where did he learn that? You know, uh, I wanted them to be able to say, yeah, that's really him. That's him doing that. Yeah. It brings a tremendous amount of verisimilitude to the role when we can see that that's you. And I was just wondering, I mean, obviously, you know, there are, you're gonna you're gonna pull a six syllable word out on me suddenly. Well, oh. you know, I'm, 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 this is getting to be a very, very dicey kind of, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one coffee deep now, so let's see. Maybe on the second one, I'll, I'll I'll go for nine. But I'm not making I'm not making any promises. I mean, it's funny because I mean, people talk about this. Obviously, what I suppose you'd call the money shots of the these incredibly iconic moments. But right. at the surface of this, underneath underpinning this, is this this timeless story that Kenny's telling in those first two, particularly in those first two episodes. And I think that that's something that it's 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 an ancient story about how you know you can apply it to so many different eras um but there's always going to be there's always going to be some bastard coming along and how people respond to that those of us that choose to be heroic i mean i feel i if i'm being honest if i was in that situation i would do what the majority of people do which is to think it's going to blow over let's just not make any fuss you know and i was just wondering what your feelings are around the the allegorical elements of v do you feel that that's something that's still relevant now um and i was wondering if you could speak to that somewhat because that's something that i don't think people talk about in regards to v too much because we all think about the wonderful lizards and special effects and all of that stuff i missed i missed greatly uh kenny johnson's uh uh remove from v uh his his dis distancing from it easy for me to say his is distancing from it because uh uh, that um, that screed uh, against uh, insidious fascism uh, has never been more relevant than it is today. Uh, demonizing of scientists, demonizing of the media. I mean, it's it's hard not to see it. Yeah, seduction, seduction of the ignorant, uh, and yeah. the seduction and the seduction toward ignorance. Um, uh, th these are these are issues that will always be with us. Um, my greatest hope is that the internet, uh, which I believe is just a, a fabulous uh, addition to humanity, uh, that the internet will uh, to force despots uh, uh, less and less from vogue and, uh, 
and draw us all closer and closer together. Um, it's a tough slog. I get that. It's a tough slog, uh, but we can't give up. We just can't give up. No, and I think one of the other very powerful allegorical messages about V is the importance of learning from history and, um, you know, not making these mistakes again. You alluded to um, Kenny's um, stepping away or being asked to step away, depending on who you speak to. I was just wondering if you could speak to, to, speak to your memories of that and your experiences of transitioning from that very auteur-driven uh, writer, producer, director-based um, original miniseries to, I guess, the more, and I don't say this disparagingly because I, I greatly enjoy the final battle, but the the more kind of committee based production of the, the final battle. I certainly felt it. I, I felt it uh, deeply. I, I, um, uh, it, it seemed that um, uh, what, we, what we began to do was to focus on uh, uh, a kind of a kaleidoscope of, of stories as opposed to a, what I would call a through line. Um, uh, if you take a look at um, if you take a look at the the show, uh, for example, uh, the Fugitive, uh, it, the old television series of the Fugitive, starring uh, uh, Richard uh, Ah, damn, Richard Diamond was was the detective's name before then. Boy, I'll I'll go to hell for that. Not thinking, not being able to remember his name. But anyway, the old the old Fugitive uh, 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 television show series had a very distinct through line. And that was this one character running to outstrip the law uh, before they, so that he could find the murderer of his wife. The one-armed man. The one-armed man. And uh, uh, David Jansen, David Jansen playing, playing uh, the fugitive. And um, somehow I, 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 I think occasionally uh, I would have preferred that that central line of ours, which was uh, the uh, subversion of society around us and the intensification of the pursuit after us, uh, would have been a little more uh, more would have been a little more strongly delineated. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I think that because we uh, because we had a more kaleidoscopic effect, we stayed in the same uh, world building schemata. But we didn't. Uh, uh, but we didn't. But it was. It was sort of uh, hard to figure how that was moving us forward in that chase and pursuit uh, 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 development uh, that uh, that would have lent a, uh, a a different sense of ongoing tension that I that I sort of missed. And I guess once you get to 1985 and you, you've got the weekly show, I guess that being a weekly show. Um, I mean, aside from, you know, budgetary demands and all of these kind of things, I suppose the temptation there for the network was to make a much more conventional show, you know, where you've got the, the guest star of the week and all of these kind of things. Um, I was just wondering, because I'm, I'm just very mindful of your time, and there's a couple of very specific things I wanted to, I wanted to get oh, to. Yep. Um, and the, the, um, I wanted to ask you about another cultural phenomena, uh, namely Dallas. Uh, you you played the I mentioned earlier on the character of Matt Cantrell during yeah. the the infamous dream season. Oh yeah, of, of, yeah. of the show. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, da Dallas had peaked at this point in popularity, but was still a large cultural force. What was it like being involved in that whirlwind? It was terrifying. Uh, I um uh, I was not a I I didn't watch Dallas uh, uh, regularly, um, uh, and it's the kind of. Uh, uh, daytime drama gone nighttime uh, wherein you needed to keep up with who was marrying who and who had had an affair with whichever and who had uh, stuck whoever in the back with a knife and uh, and pulled a bad deal and done all this other kind of stuff uh, and who was actually the hidden cousin of who else and so when I got on the set I had no, I had no idea who any of that stuff was and uh, I, I lived in a in a constant sweat um, because, uh, because I just didn't know the, I didn't know those storylines and I didn't know those characters, interactions and relationships. Uh, and so, uh, the lines that I was saying, um, uh, I gave as much force and animation to, and, and commitment to, but I could have been reading the, you know, the phone book, uh, or the, or the racing forms because, <laughs> uh, 
uh, because I, I couldn't keep up with, uh, with, what I was, with what I was supposed to be aiming at. I had a great time. I will say that I had a great time. Well, I'd imagine it's very difficult to be in the proximity of Larry Hagman and not enjoy yourself. Um, Larry, <laughs> Hagman, Larry Hagman was the most amazing director. Uh, every other director, we, when we went to work, we worked all day long. We worked the full 12 hours and we worked whatever there was left over to be done. Larry Hagman, when he directed, uh, his lifetime in the theater and his family heritage in the, in the theater and the film industry enabled him to shoot us in eight hours and everybody went home. And it was an extraordinary, that was another extraordinary learning experience. He was an amazing, amazing professional, that guy. Yeah, great, great, great director. And also, I mean, I think that it's fair to say that the, the marriage of Larry Hagman and the character of J.R. Ewing is one of the great modern uh, characters in, 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 in a lot of ways. And I think oh, it's yeah. easy. I mean, I'd have thought that your, your anxieties around, um, you know, bluffing your way through the character must have been exacerbated by the fact that it's really easy for people to forget what a force that show was in the cu cultural consciousness in the 80s. And I'm just wondering, Mark, are you... Are you a nostalgic person? Do you ever look back? Do you ever keep souvenirs from the things that you were in or uh, watch things that you've done in the past? Or are you on to, are you were onto the next thing kind of person? I, I, I can't say that I'm an amnesiac, but on the other hand, yeah, I am more looking to the present and the future. I was going to tell you another story, by the way. You're talking about Larry Hagman and, and, and people like that. I worked mm -hmm. with uh, Chuck Connors, who played the rifleman. Uh, and I worked in a in a uh, movie for television called High Desert Kill, which he which he the title of which he came up with right right on the set because they didn't have a title, and he he told us how to how to come up with a title. I'll give I'll pass that secret along in a minute. But anyway, uh, there were three of us and Chuck, and uh, and Chuck Connors in his first scene had about five pages of dialogue, and we come up in the desert and we find Chuck out there and we say, howdy partner. And we, you know, break into some sort of dialogue. He does five pages. Well, it's his first day on camera. Uh, we'd been already filming the three of us as a pack. We'd been filming for a few days. So we were pretty comfortable in front of the camera and with our characters and our interplay. So early in the morning, we knocked on his dressing room door, his trailer door, and we said, Chuck, you want to you want to go through the lines of the scene? Now you just, this is your first day, and you're you're doing five pages. He said, "What?" I said, "You want to do five? He's come on in, come on in, come on, come on, come on." So we went inside his dressing. He said, "Say, he said, you want what do you want me to do? You want to re you want to rehearse?" He said, "Yeah." He's give it give the kid over there the the script. Turn to the turn to the page. Turn to the scene. And so the youngest member of our group he got ripped out, and he turned to the last page of the scene. And Chuck said, make sure, is that the last page? He said, yeah. Start at the last word that I speak. And the guy said, the last word that you speak is forever. He said, now read every word to me. He said, now just read along with me. He said, I'm going to do all the words backwards. And he did it five pages backwards, <laughs> word for word. Wow. Word for word. I mean, there are some amazing talents. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> this industry, yeah, yeah. There's preparation, and then there's preparation. That's uh, that, yeah. that, that's amazing. And yeah. uh, last but not least, I have to ask you this: Do you have a favorite verse or line of Shakespeare? Something that rattles around your brain that when you're sort of alone in a room with nice acoustics, you can't uh, you can't resist. Is there anything that speaks to you or is speaking to you at the moment? I, uh, you, it always takes me a moment to prepare this one because it's a it's it's seemingly easy, but it isn't. It's Richard the Third. Uh, and it's uh, Richard talking about Buckingham. And Richard says, we know each other's faces, but for our hearts, he knows no more of mine than I of yours, nor I know more of his than you of mine. That's an extraordinary piece of construction. And uh, it's a little harder to memorize than you might imagine. And if anybody wants to study Shakespeare, let them start with a line like that as a cue or a clue to how deeply thought out 
are the resonances that Shakespeare builds into every word and every every thought that his characters speak. But that's that's about my that's about my favorite. I like that one. Well, I think that's a that's a great place to finish up. Such a short passage could be can be circled and looked at so many ways and be such a useful tool and such an incredible exercise. And I just want to say thank you so much, Mark, for your generosity of time and for all of the work and entertainment you've given us um, over the years. We've, you've got a lot of fans and um, we, we love going back and watching and we look forward to anything that you might have coming down the pike. So thank you so much for your time. This has been one of the most enjoyable and, uh, and uh, uh, dare I say, most literate uh, uh, conversations I've had on these kinds of topics. I, I appreciate your own uh, uh, the, the refinement that you that you bring to the process is is refreshing and and also uh, just damn good fun. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Mark.